good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice Amen. and be glad in it. What a beautiful day outside. Yeah. Just, I was looking for the one lone cloud that was going to rain on me today. <laughs> I didn't see it. I didn't find it. So this must be a really great day. So we got a lot of fun things coming up uh, uh, in the weeks ahead here. Uh, very, very interesting study for this Wednesday night. Pastor Terry's going to uh, talk about that in his message today. As we go through the Truth Project, we're starting on Lesson 8, which is Unio Mystica, which means um, it is the mystery of the union. Union mystery. God's uh, mysteric union with us. So it talks about the uh, social sphere that we talked about in sociology, but it goes a step beyond and it takes us into uh, our relationship with God, the mystical union between God and man. And uh, here it's, it's we talk about the intimate three, the family, the church, and God-man relationship. And we kind of touched upon some of that last week, but here we go into the real depth of that relationship and what that relationship means. And so uh, it's, it's really, really uh, interesting to see because we take a look at what actually Christ purchased with his life. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm suffering from migraine today and I'm, I can't quite formulate words too well, so I'm uh, trying to make it through it. So thanks. Uh, so just bear with me a little bit. Um, so Christ purchased our lives with the purchase of his blood the spilling of his blood and it's not simply salvation but hell but it is the invitation to join with God himself and that is what really people kind of fail to understand and so we're going to talk about that mystical union between God and man where God said okay with the death of Christ I want to bring us back into that original relationship that we had back in the Garden of Eden before the fall and so it's a restoration process uh, between us and God. So it's a very, very important uh, lesson that we learn on uh, today and on Wednesday. Uh, so really, really looking forward to that. I'll be in working in Nashville and Asheville, uh, North Carolina and Tennessee this week. So I won't be around on Wednesday. i try and be back Saturday. So, Which brings me up to my next point. Uh, July 2nd, this next Saturday, we have Faith of Our Fathers, which is an awesome, awesome movie, and uh, I think you guys are really going to like it. it. It's a very stirring movie, so back on the shelves back there, we got plenty of Kleenex and everything ready to go, um, but it should be a, a great movie. Doors open at 5.30, movie at 6, as usual, lots of free food and uh, good fellowship. And then on July 9th, the following Saturday, we'll have... Orange Track Racing, and so uh, we had quite a lively crowd here this last time around, and and uh, really the, the watching the kids out here is really fun. Uh, so we have these floor mats out here that have little uh, streets and everything on it. Boy, they were just racing them around on there. And though one of our newcomers that came, he says, "Hey, I've got a couple more of those mats. You can put them together and make a town." He says want them I'd be more than happy to donate them to you and so he's going to be bringing us in a couple of those mats as well and, and uh, so it's always a great time we had a lot of new people here this last time and so it's a great way to reach out uh, so we have a lot of fun things coming up and uh, we kind of talked about this a couple of times when we're planning to try and have uh, a picnic this, this fall when the heat wave stops and uh, try to have a good get together, just a time of fellowship, and and uh, you know maybe grilling some ribs and things like that. So uh, something fun to have and join together with. So let's go to God in prayer and start off our time of worship this morning. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the day that you have made today for us, uh, for our lives, and we appreciate it. 
Lord, we thank you for another day in your presence and another day of life. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who sacrificed himself on the cross to save us of our sins and to bring us back into that right relationship with you. Lord, we, we open our hearts to you to hear your message that you've given to Pastor Terry today. We, we open our hearts to receive that message, open our ears to hear our eyes to see the beauties and wonders of the world that you have created for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather here together freely and openly in your name and to bring praise, honor, and glory to you, Father God. And we thank you for the opportunities to reach out to others in your name, to lift them up in prayer when, when they have problems in their lives and, and they need healing. They need comfort. They need guidance, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be your representatives, to represent Christ to them. Father God, we just pray that you would open our minds right now, Lord, to receive this message and to pull, play it out in our heads and our hearts throughout the coming week to be able to live it out according to your will and so we thank you for these things today, Lord, for blessing us with your presence here in this very room. As the scripture tells us that when three or more are gathered together in your name, you are there amongst us, Lord. And we just praise you and thank you. And we're honored to have you here with us today. We pray these things and claim them as victories in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the call to worship that Pastor Terry has, has uh, brought forth for us today comes from John 14, verses 19 through 20 in the New Living Translation. And it says, Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That's quite a powerful verse if we stop to think about it. See, we've been afforded a special place with God through our faith in Jesus. And this passage here is but the opening statement by Jesus, whose words were sent from the Father. So think about what a glorious message that is for us to understand, to hear it, to receive it, and to live it out. That because we have that faith and because we obey his commands, we will be given that spirit of holiness to dwell within us, and we will be given a special privilege. See, it goes on to tell us in here, in John 14, it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. We are truly one with the Father through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So if we stop and think about that, that's this unio mystica, that mystical union. We are invited to gather in and be part of that union between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. by faith and by obeying the commands that Jesus has given us. What an awesome, awesome privilege. Mm -hmm. What an awesome God we serve. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for opening your word and opening our hearts and opening our eyes. Lord, bring us fully into our understanding. Bless Pastor Terry as he gives this message today. Lord, just open his mind, open his heart to pour it out to us with the passion that I know that he has. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have given us this mystery to be unfolded and that you have made us part of that special union by our faith, our faith in you. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, with that, I best not put anybody to sleep or just talk monotone. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning.
Mark mentioned this on Wednesday night. With, with a series like this, um, we're given material. And in that material, we're able to kind of turn it into and make it our own. And sometimes that can be very difficult. And this was no less the case. Um, Wednesday night, we had just watched session seven, and it is so intimately connected to this message that it was it was a challenge in and of itself just for that. But Unio Mystica, am I alone? That's the question that I'm asking now. I want you to think about that throughout the message this morning, and we're going to answer that at the very end. We're going to give you the groundwork or the foundation to answer that question throughout it. Now, um, Unio Mystica, what in the world? Well, Mark already gave us a little bit of it, but every time you hear it, it's like you forget what the meaning was. Well, Unio Mystica is Latin for mystical union, and we're not talking about um, mythology here. We're not talking about uh, other uh, so-called religions or, or ways of life. We are talking about the mystical union between God and man. And what does that mean? It means the merging of the individual consciousness cognitively or effectively with a superior or supreme consciousness. That superior or supreme consciousness is God. Let there be no mistake. And this is what we heard in the call to worship this morning. And um, for those of you that were looking at the screen going, uh, C? Um, sorry. When you do control C to copy something and it you don't get the control button all the way down, it just puts a C. So, again, John 14, 19, and 11 was that passage. And it's, it is a very important passage, as, as Mark said. Soon the world will no longer see me, but, we'll, but you will see me. We have an opportunity as believers, as Christians, to see God, to see Jesus. And that is all courtesy of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. See, since I live, you also will live. And in saying that, he's ultimately connecting us to God through himself, Jesus is. So we're connected with Jesus. Jesus is already connected with God. And this, this brings these, these connected circles that we've been talking about on Wednesday nights. And I'm not going to get into those today because, well... I want you to come Wednesday night and see it for yourself. Um, so, but this is the kind of thing that just reiterates what Jesus said to Martha just before raising Lazarus. So in John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, those of you that have read the story know the answer. She says, I do. But she doesn't, she's not completely grasping what he's talking about. He's really talking about that he's going to raise Lazarus. But he's also talking about when it is the time of the resurrection, when we join Jesus. But see, that's when life ends. Life ends here, though. But for Christians... Abundant life is beginning at that point. For non-Christians, well, I don't even want to imagine what that looks like. I mean, there's John does a pretty vivid explanation of what hell looks like in Revelation. And I'm, I'm not going to get into that today, but I would, I would challenge you to go out and read that. Because um, it's not meant to, well, what was that saying, scared straight here some 30, 40 years ago? They sent kids into prisons to talk to prisoners to scare them straight. It's kind of like the egg in the frying pan. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. It, it, it was an illustration. But here's the thing. It's, no matter how we think about it, in some mysterious way, because it's hard for us to grasp this whole concept, but in some mysterious way, we as Christians are connected to God through Jesus Christ. And we are connected to Jesus in a very similar yet mysterious way. It's a connection that starts the moment that we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It is a mystery that 
we will find, let me rephrase that. It's in this mystery that we will find the divine intimacy that God has for us, for each of us. So that begs the question, what is a mystery? Well, it's defined as something not understood or beyond understanding. Now, Diane's been watching this, uh, this magician on, on Netflix, and I mean, you, you can't, I, you're holding your eyes like this, trying not to blink, trying to catch what he's doing and how he manages to do it, but you just can't. It's a mystery on how he does it. And then he goes to explain it, but then his explanation is all part of the next trick. And it's a trick in that. It's, but it's something that we can't understand because we aren't, that's not our profession. Now, it's also defined as a piece of fiction dealing usually with the solution of a mysterious crime. Now, this gets me, this takes me way back. Do any of you love a good mystery? Like, do you, do you like reading mystery novels? I know in, in the, the video on Wednesday, he's going to talk about the Hardy Boys. No, I got a different one. My, I told you my mom worked at, at the Meredith Warehouse. I have this set at home. It's the masterpieces of mystery, selected by none other than Ellery Queen. These are good. I read them. They're good. There's they're short stories throughout. There's another set that's 20 volumes. I just have the eight volume set. But it's in perfect condition. I looked and they're running a pretty good penny right now, like 300 bucks. So online so it's like yeah let's hang on to that for a little while longer it's a good investment mm -hmm. it's a mystery to me why they are worth that much but again <laughs> but let's go back to that definition there's also this definition a religious truth that one can know only by revelation and cannot fully understand now that is more in line with what we're talking about it then gives them this example, and this is out of the current Merriam-Webster dictionary, so I got a little excited. It says, this is the example that it gives. It says, the mystery of the Trinity. I about fell out of my chair because I was not expecting that. I was expecting something out of the 1828 edition, which goes in, it's a little bit more in depth. It says, in religion, anything in the character or attributes of God or in the economy of divine providence which is not revealed to man. That's pretty on point. Too bad they took it out of the current dictionary. Now, let's, let's go back a week. Now, don't have a DeLorean, but we're going to travel back a week and go to the passage that Mark read last week, or a portion of that passage. He read from Ephesians 5, and we're going to just pull out uh, verses 31 and 32. This is what Paul writes to the Ephesians. He says, As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two... Are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Now, if we look back into this section, and this the whole passage that Mark read last week, verses 21 through 33, Paul's talking about a spirit led or spirit guided relationships. And verse 23 specifically talks about how the husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, remember, <coughs> and, and we got to go back to last week again, remember, we are not talking about the world's distorted view of submitting, which has come to mean uh, having our rights taken away by intimidation or force. And um, you can go to any news this week and see people who feel that way. Now, what we're talking about is the biblical sense of the word, where we freely and openly yield our will to another authority. And in this case, we are yielding our authority to God. Now this kind of relationship is intimate. And not only that, it is a permanent relationship. Now, last Sunday, and then in further detail on Wednesday, we heard about the divine imprint on our relationships. The intimacy of which is a mystery. We talked about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Probably one of the hardest 
of the relationships to understand because it is, we're talking about the triune God, three in one. And then we also talked about husband, wife, and children. Now, we're all so very different that even these relationships, you now it's hard enough to get to our relationship with God, right? But even this type of relationship, so if you're the husband or if you're the wife or you're the one of the children, you know, husband reacting with wife and children, that's a difficult relationship. Wife, same. Children, same. It's a difficult relationship. And believe me, well, I think all of you here have had teenagers, so we know that difficult relationship. But then there was one more. It was Christ, leaders, and flock, and how that all comes together. And so there we have it. There is a mystery in these relationships or these unions. And, and this is the mystical union. And we're going to go through each of these a little bit here. A little bit different order. But let's talk about between God and man or the unio mystica. The mystical union that exists between God and man. Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God has invited us into an intimate, personal relationship with himself. And if you go and you listen to uh, other messages or, or from these other churches that um, they talk about, they're, they're progressive. This is, they, this is all gets wired down. And, and I, would say, I would even go so far as to say there's Christianity. There's no such thing as progressive Christianity because by progressive, they're taking God out of the mix. And if we take God out of the mix, that's not Christianity. So I would, I would submit that there is no such thing as progressive Christianity. But on a larger sense, this mystery extends to the intimate union found within marriage and the church. So let's talk about this mystical union between Christ and his church. Jesus who was sent by the Father, came from heaven to live in the world, but not of it. And that's what he calls us to do, to live in this world, because, well, we really don't have a choice. We're here, but not of it. And just like us, sin was all around him. People were doing the same things then as they do today. There is nothing, as, as Ecclesiastes says, there is nothing new under the sun they're doing the same thing there are technologies and other things that have maybe made things sin more widespread or more easily or readily available but it's the same and jesus also showed us how we are to treat one another see in matthew 5 jesus reminds us to love our neighbor and then he takes it a step further telling us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. That's hard to do. That's really hard to do. Everyone's been hurt by somebody. And thinking about that, praying for them? Yes, Lord. There's that submission. That willing submission. Because, Lord, I, I want to be more like you. I have to submit to and Jesus was, and he continues to show us how to be in a relationship with others. And so therefore, the, Christ, the, uh, the relationship that Christ has with the church is also the illustration for another type of relationship. And that's the relationship between husband and wife, man and woman. And yes, I said it, man is not about dominating over the other. Rather, it is how we can imitate Christ's love. Yes, the scriptures tell us to submit. But remember, that is a willingness, not a subjugation. The Bible has quite a bit to say about marriage. And it's not something that just appears here or there or in, in the New Testament. It starts all the way back in Genesis. On Wednesday night, um, 
we heard Dr. Tackett asked one of the students to read a passage. But before that, he said, what did God say? He said, it is good, it is good, it is good. And he went on and on with that. But then he had one of the students read 218. And the student started reading. He said, then the Lord God said, it is not good. And t Dr. Tackett just cut him off. He did that a bunch of times, too. Wouldn't that be frustrating? But all this it is good, all is good, comes back to it is not good. Well, here's the thing. God wasn't finished creating humans in his own image. Finally, he has him finish the passage saying, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. And then a few verses later, God makes woman a partner to be in relationship with himself and the man. So in Genesis 2.24, we read, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now, we just read that a little bit ago, and we heard it last week from, Master, from Pastor Mark. And the two are united into one. Talk about mystical unions. How can they become one flesh? Well, if we are imitating Christ's love for the church, then we are nurturing those in our care. And that is becoming one flesh. And just as the church freely submits to Jesus to accomplish the mission that Christ has set before us, we submit to one another. So here's what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. He says, Therefore go and make disciples of what all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, We're all uniquely different. And he's asking us to partner together and to strengthen one another to fulfill his mission. Likewise, a husband and a wife are uniquely different. I guarantee you if Diane is cold, I am hot. And if I am cold, she is hot. We're uniquely different. But we're meant to partner together to complement one another and to strengthen one another. And looking at each of these relationships, if they are not in harmony, what happens? They fall apart. Mm -hmm. Philippians 2, 3 and 8 says this, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And this tells me that he came in, because he did this, he came into unity. In unity, the body of Christ, or the making of many into one. So, many members means we form one body with unique gifts and roles. And yes, Mark and Lori and Diane and Harold, as I was doing that, I was floating back into my... Uh, Emmaus walk and singing one bread one body yep got that in your mind right now but here's what Paul wrote to the Romans in, in 12 four, five. he says just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function so it is with Christ's body we are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other 1 Corinthians 12 12 through 31 expands on that theme of one body with many parts. And I'm not going into that. I want you to write that passage down and I want you to go out and read it later. I'm giving you homework. 
It's not bad homework. It's good homework. But Paul is using the analogy of the body and all its parts and how they work together with the very nature of what the church is. Unity. We are one body, the church, God's children. And it also brings in diversity. Each of us brings something different to the table. And in that, there are no racial, gender, economic, political, or any other kind of differences. Because in the scriptures, it says, remember in Matthew 28, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, indicating not just the Jews or the Israelites, but all nations, including the Gentiles. And then it's about the gifts. Not only do we need to recognize our gifts and accept those gifts, but we also need to use them, and this is the important part, in the way that God intended us to use them. But this takes us right back to the mystery of Christ. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Listen to what Paul writes to the Galatians in 3, 26 and 28. He says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this takes us back. We need to remember, so we're coming into the family, right? But we're being adopted into that family. And what happened in Roman culture? How, why did Paul use that kind of language? Because in Roman culture, if you were adopted, you were no different than a biological son or daughter. You became as if you were biological. So all the walls between us are gone, and we become one. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't have ADHD or anything like that, but all I heard was uh, President Reagan saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to tear down that wall in our society and let people see what God's love is all about. And this is the vision that Jesus has for the church. In John 13, Jesus tells us to love one another using the same example that he gave. He loved us so much that he died on the cross for us. Loving like Jesus will show everyone, and I mean everyone, mm -hmm. that we are his disciples. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to John, this time 17, 20 and 23, where he says, Jesus is saying, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will not know that you sent me or will know that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. Open your mystique. It is an intimacy that requires us to communicate. What did we see Jesus doing all the time with God? He was talking to God. He was praying. When we think of ourselves as different from one another, we remove the oneness that Jesus is talking about here. And this has disastrous results. Think about racism and prejudice and intolerance and so many other things that ultimately divide us because we think of ourselves different from one another. This is why oneness with one another, with Jesus and with God, is so important, but yet it is still a mystery. Now, on Wednesday, we will go into more detail, but there are just a few of the things that they point out on Wednesday that I wanted to touch base with you, things of the church. And in 1 Peter, show sincere love to each other. Share each other's burdens, he tells the Galatians. And James, James writes, pray for each other. And then in Romans 12, it says, live in harmony with each other. Dr. Tackett fills the screen, not just once, but twice, with things that we need to do 
for each other or for one another. And it's very important. But yet, in our humanness, we have a constant hunger for significance. So many people out in the world are searching for the significance in life, of what that is for them, what their meaning in life is. There's a void in one or more aspects of their lives, and that's at home, or it might be at school, or work, or any other of many places. Even, there's people even in churches that have that void. But as they look for that meaning, they are crying out for a few things. They're crying out for love. They're crying out for respect. They're crying out for dignity and so much more. It's a hole that unfortunately too many do not ever get filled. And what they don't realize is the world can't fill that hole, that need. Relying on the world, they are going to run into obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And they are going to lose more and more hope along the way because what happens when you run into the proverbial brick wall? You lose hope that you're going to get to the other side of it. And if you keep running into it, well, you're probably going to get a migraine or a headache at the very minimum. But you lose hope on getting through that. Instead of getting on your knees and, and praying to God and saying, God, how do I get... Th Maybe he's going to throw a, a rope over the, the wall, or he's going to put a ladder up against it, or he's going to say, it's not that wide, just go around it. But they're looking for ways to go through it, and they just can't get there. That's just that obstacle. Now, a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, the memorial stones and the tassels. The memorial stones were to, things to remember events. And um, God had then commanded the children of Israel to tie tassels on their robes in order to remember what? The commandments of the Lord. We're going to talk about that just a little bit more here because the tassels, they were also meant to help the Israelites keep from their own selfish and self-centered desires. And this goes back to that hunger for significance. They're looking to themselves to get where they want to be instead of doing what they should, which is relying on God. In other words, we need to do things God's way and not our own. Let's go back to where this passage was. It was Numbers 7, or 15, verses 38 and 39. It says, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. Now, blue, blue was a sign of royalty. And that's why they chose blue for the tassel, so that they would remember it as the Lord. And then he goes on and he says, you will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember, so you will remember all the commandments of the Lord, that you may obey them. And I chose this passage or this version for the very poignant use of the words. And not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lusts of your own hearts and I. I'm going, to, I'm going to get a little more into that why I chose that, but join us Wednesday night and you'll see Dr. Taggart takes it a step further when he's talking about this. But these tassels were for us, or for the Israelites to remember, and they were to prevent them from prostituting oneself. Now, prostitute is somebody who receives money in return for sexual acts or a person who sells their abilities talent or skills for an unworthy purpose. And we're going to hang on to that last part of that. Their abilities, talents, or skills for an unworthy purpose. When we look to the other means of fulfilling our drive for significance, God says we are prostituting ourselves. In other words, we are looking to idols. We are selling ourselves out for the golden calves. Now remember when Moses was up on the mountain, what did they do? They got Aaron to make the golden calves. Well, that wasn't the last time that happened. Fast forward. God has ripped the kingdom from David. And Jeroboam, what does he do? He makes a couple of golden calves because he doesn't want everybody going down to Jerusalem to worship because then they'll just stay in Judah and they'll be 
it'll reunite the kingdom, he won't have his kingship. He made two golden calves again. And he causes Israel to sin. Jesus talks about prostituting oneself for selfish gain or for, for self-centeredness. He does this when he's criticizing the religious leaders in Matthew 23. And this comes from verses 1 and 7. He says this, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. So he's saying what they're, what they're telling them is correct, but then he says, don't follow their example. Basically, the, the religious leaders were, uh, they told you to walk the walk, but, or walk the talk, but they didn't. He continues and says, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels. And they love to sit at the head table at banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk into the marketable places and to be called rabbi. You know what I took out of all of that? Six words. Everything they do is for show. Today is no different. People do things to get noticed and, and to gain recognition from others. People want that 15 minutes of fame. And, well, technology, specifically social media, has just made that want or desire or need much worse. Now, don't get me wrong, social media has its positives. That's kind of how we stay connected with our kids. That's where we see the pictures. And we hear what they're doing when they forget to tell us what's going on. But do the positives really outweigh the negatives? Just something to think about. I'm not going to answer that. We cannot be using these types of things to find our significance or our meaning in life. Only God can do that. The source of significance and our meaning come from it's through relationship with him that whatever it is we are seeking is filled. We need to be like Jesus, selfless rather than self-centered. Remember, he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And what does he do? He takes off his robe, he puts on an apron, grabs a basin, and washes the disciples' feet. He serves them. But instead of God serving us, what, what needs to happen? We need to serve. He is not some genie in the bottle that you can rub the side and... Yeah, you're all thinking, if I dream a genie, I know it. You can't just rub the side and say, Oh, hey, you're here at my beck and command. I want this or I want that. When it comes to serving, it, we serve God willingly. Now, if you need a refresher on what it means to submit to God and what it truly means and how it's not subjugation... Go out to Grace Street Duck Church, at the top, click Messages, listen to Pastor Mark's message from last week again. He goes into more detail on that. But God made a covenant with us, and he has never wavered from it. Never. We, can, we can't say the same. We're all over the place. It's time to return to God and to that relationship. In John 14, Jesus tells us that he will send another advocate who will never leave us and will always guide us. We have someone there. We have an advocate. We have the Holy Spirit who will guide us through. And since the Holy Spirit lives in us, we need to remember what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, when he says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy, and you are that 
that temple? And it's only then that we can answer the question, am I alone? But before we get to that, I, I ran across a passage or a, a quotation from St. Augustine of Hippo. He said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Think about that hole in our heart, that hole that does that what we're trying to find, that significance in life. Our heart is restless until it rests in you. Psalm 42, 1 and 2 says, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. Where can I go and stand before him? Now, that deer is dependent on that water. And in this psalm, the psalmist is actually talking about the distance that that deer is from the water, how he is longing for those streams of water, for that, that life-giving quenching of its thirst. But then the next part of it, it says, I thirst for God, the living God. There's a chasm there. And only by submitting to God, reading the scriptures, and, and studying his word, and, and being in an intimate relationship, will that distance get shorter. Our lives depend on God just as the deer's life depends on that water. So it's my prayer that each of you thirst for God like your life depends on it. Because it does. It depends on it. Now, I'm not going to leave you hanging. But let's go back to the question. Am I alone? Big and bold on the screen. Am I alone? Here's the answer. With God, you are never, ever alone. Father God, we thank you that in you we are never alone. That this mystical union that, that we have with you, while the scriptures give us guidance and the Spirit gives us guidance, it's still a mystery to us. And it's hard for us in our finite minds to understand that that's in part part of the way that it's supposed to be. Father, let us not look to the things of this world. Let us not be dependent on others or material things, any of that, Father. Let us be dependent on you as a deer is dependent on that water for life, so we are dependent on you, Father. And let that, that distance between us grow ever less and shorter. So that when our life does end, Father, that we are joining you in eternity. But that in this life as we have it right now, Father, that we are never alone because you are always with us. Father, we thank you. We praise you and we give all the glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kerry. So, Unio Mystica mystical union between God and man is brought to life in the act of communion because if we look at the word communion itself it is actually bringing that community of God together bringing us all in one communion with one another we are bring, brought together to celebrate that mystery of God in his son Jesus because when Jesus died on the cross, that bond was created, recreated, reconstructed between God and man. And we celebrate that. We remember that each time we take communion. So that's why when you take a look in him, it says, you know, you are to remember when we're, we're doing communion. Is we are remembering that God recreated, reconstructed that union between God and man through his son Jesus as the word to remember that. That is what communion is about, is for us to recall God stepping forth to us, coming out to us through his son Jesus.
breaking down all the barriers, as he said in Matthew, that go into all the world and make disciples of all men. See, the whole Old Testament was all about the Israelites and, and his chosen people, but they failed. And so God says, I want to bring all men together. So we are to go out and make disciples of all nations. No one is left out. Male, female, no matter what your color is. God reunited the entire world. And so as we do this in remembrance of God recreating that union between God and man, that rejoining together, we do that at our communion time. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed and he was sharing that Seder meal with the disciples, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Christ broke his physical body down, taking on the sins of man at that point in time. With this in remembrance of me. And he took a cup and he filled it up and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's God washing us clean of those sins. That's Jesus pouring out his blood to make us clean. To make that bond between God and man come back to life. All then he goes on and he says, each time that you take of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Remember that I recreated the bond between man and God that was broken down by a sinful act of man. And now I reconstruct that so that you can be with me forever into eternity through Christ Jesus. If we have faith and obey his commands, as it said, in the scripture when we started this morning. So the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. And I always end it with thanks be to God because that's truly what we need to do. Be thankful to God for this act of remembrance. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's time for prayers for the people, friends, and families. <laughs> so, um, today there was a few uh, prayers on the prayer list for um, Carl's uncle Clyde and um, for William Davis uh, from Raleigh. One of Mark's friends, co-workers, and for Bridgehaven, and all of the employees, volunteers, and clients, and for the court justice, I believe, and um, for their protection. Is there anybody else that would like prayer for I, Mark? I, I, for your job and for, for guidance yes for, for guidance okay yeah. all right okay <clears throat> well father god we come to you this morning and we just praise you for who you are and we thank you for all things lord jesus and we lift up don for direction for the right jobs and the right opportunities for work lord god be with him through these weeks and help him to know exactly what you have in store for him. And I pray for Doug also for the same things. Give them peace in their minds and their hearts. And keep them safe within your arms, Lord Jesus. And Father God, we are here to honor you and praise you. And we lift up this beautiful day that you have given us. We thank you for life and breath. And for the world in which we live in. We honor you by attending church and learning from your anointed pastors that about your unfailing love for us to teach us. To them we are truly grateful. 
um, they share the truth of your word to all of us who will listen. And we thank you for their dedication to you, O oh God. Please hear our prayers today as we lift up Clyde, and we thank you for his life on this earth and the hearts of those who love and care for him. We pray for him, his safe travels, for him and family, and um, who follow him from hospital to hospital, that he will receive the best care and treatment that is possible for his situation. I pray your Holy Spirit be with the doctors and the nurses, that you supersede the surgery and the best outcome possible will happen for Clyde. I lift up Will Davis to you, Lord. We thank you for his life and the miracles that you are doing daily for him and his family. We pray you break the diabetic coma that has overcome him and you breathe the breath of life back into his soul that he will wake up today and find renewed life in him. Comfort his family who goes through this trial in his life with him. Be with all of them, Lord God, and just let no bad thing enter his body, Lord Jesus. Protect him from all of that. And we thank you, Father God, for this Supreme Court justice, his decision to do your will and overturn Roe and Wade. We praise you for that decision, Father God. We thank you for their courage to do your will. We pray for protection over all of them and their loved ones, that no harm will come to them or their property. We pray for Bridge Haven and centers like it all throughout the country. We pray for the employees, the volunteers, the clients that you will protect and guard them from the evildoers that wish to harm them. Put a hedge of protection around them. Place your Holy Spirit with them to fight against the evil forces of this world. In Ephesians 6, we pray the armor of God cover them all through this battle they are, that they are facing. Let them be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so they can stand against the devil's schemes. We thank you, Father God, that you hear our cries for help and that you act for us. You are our rock and our shield, our tower of refuge, the mighty fortress in whom we trust. Thank you for your unfailing love, for your people and all who will call upon your name. Our help is it comes from you, O oh Lord. We exalt your whole you today and praise your holy name. Jesus God and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for all things. Amen. Amen. <coughs> This does end our online portion of our service today. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, check the chat, the videos, and the links should be in there for you to go ahead and worship those songs. But as we send you out, I pray this priestly blessing upon you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go out in peace and show God's love to you.